Hola, buenos dias, buenvenidos, good morning, hello, lovely to see you all. Thank you so much for joining us bright and early. You all get bonus points. My name's Oshin Lunny, I'm your MC for this morning. I'm very, very happy to be here. I grew up in Ireland, I lived in the UK, and I've recently moved over to Spain. And now I call Un Poquito Pueblo, about an hour drive from Barcelona, my home. So uh, thank you for welcoming me here today. Um, we're here at day three of IBTM World. The footfall has been fantastic. I think we almost hit 10 thousand people yesterday which is wonderful it's a real sign of confidence in our industry of moving forward of planning exciting things for the future and of course you know we're all here to make to bring the best out of our events for 2022 to deliver maximum value for the people who come to our events for the sponsors and partners that invest in our events and this is all about differentiating your event from all the others making your event your venue your planning the best it can possibly be and one of the factors that can really make a difference to your events is keynote speakers, is wonderful folks on stage saying really interesting things that are very compelling, very PR worthy, and rock star names that will bring people to your event, that will be that tipping point that makes them choose your event over another. So I'm very happy to be here on behalf of my agent, a wonderful man over here called Ben Myers. Take it, have a wave, Ben, thank you very much. He is from an agency called Thinking Heads. You can go and see them at Stand A12. They represent some folks you may have heard of, like Malala, Richard Branson, Yuval Noah Harari, Guy Kawasaki, the former chief evangelist at Apple Computers. And they also represent our first keynote speaker here this morning. Um, before I introduce the speaker, I just want to say my name's Oshin Lunny. I'm a freelance event MC at Thinking Heads, an occasional journalist and occasional professor of UX-driven business. Feel free to go and visit Ben at Stand A12 to learn about the Thinking Heads roster here in beautiful Spain. Okay, so I would like to welcome to the stage Dr. Darren Coleman, and his keynote is entitled To Win Through Brand Experiences, Don't Focus on on the experiences. So it's not only a great demonstration of the kind of thought leadership that Thinking Heads represents, but it's also something for you, it's something for us all to learn of. Uh, all the wonderful people here in the auditorium, all the folks watching us on demand, this is of huge value to you as an event organizer, as a MICE professional, and uh, I do hope you'll enjoy it. Now, Darren has gone to the trouble of making a fantastic interactive presentation. There will be slides on the screen and you can vote in real time. Please keep it clean, folks. And uh, we, Darren is gonna be commenting on the things that you suggest and the votes that you cast. It's super easy to use. You just put the URL into your phone or tablet and you can vote in real time. It'll come up on the screen in real time. So. Why are we inviting Darren on stage to speak about this? Why now and why should you listen to Darren? Well, why this subject? A growing number of events organizers and their clients are competing through experiences, but Darren's experience shows organizations to develop and evolve their thinking beyond experiences to encompass brand experiences. So this is a subtle but hugely important point Darren's talk will make. And why now? Well, of course, as the world evolves from COVID-19, at different stages, organizations are turning their attention to how they can drive scalable growth through brand experiences. Dr. Coleman is here to help you do that. And why this speaker? Well, over the past 20 years, Dr. Darren Coleman has been hired to help brands around the globe drive growth and retain relevance through brand experiences. His clients include Fujifilm, Johnson & Johnson, the National Bank of Abu Dhabi, to name but a few. So I appreciate it's very early, we're on day three, but I would be very grateful if you could give our first keynote speaker a huge round of IBTM applause. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Darren Coleman. Thank you. Thanks, Osin. Picture the following scenario. You're having a meeting with a colleague and you're planning an event for next summer. It's the first time that you've planned an event for some time now. Your colleague is a little bit nervous. The last time you planned an event, it was really experiential. They say to you, well, it didn't go so well. It was a bit flat, it felt fragmented, and the format didn't scale across your global footprint. 
your client is losing their confidence. They're losing the courage and confidence of conviction to compete and win through brand experiences. You realize you need to do two things. First, you need to help your colleague understand that they need to move beyond the trappings of experiences to understand the substance of building brand experiences. Secondly, they need to appreciate why it's important they can weave their brand into the fabric of the experiences they build to deliver greater emotive value. In my keynote today, I want to provide you with some practical advice that will help you to win through brand experiences. In my keynote, I'm going to make three important points. First, why you need to compete through brand experiences. Second, why you need to weave your brand into the fabric of the experiences you build so that you can give them greater emotive appeal. Third, I'm going to share a practical management tool that we use extensively with our clients around the globe so you can deliver brand experiences with consistency at scale. So before I close, I've made some time for some questions. As we go through, if you do have some questions, please note them down. We'll submit them to the poll, and then we'll be able to vote on them. Thank you. I'd like to share a disclaimer. The knowledge that I'm going to share with you today works really well with our clients. But some companies have different ways of doing things, and that works well for them. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. But what I'd encourage you to do is think a bit like a sponge. Retain the information and squeeze out where you think the value lies for you. So if I move on to the first point that I'd like to make, why compete through brand experiences? Well, firstly, there's a large body of research out there which shows that brand experiences drive performance. This could be financial metrics such as revenues, or brand-related metrics such as awareness, advocacy, or relative satisfaction. One piece of research from agency Jack Morton really caught my attention. And it shows how brands, how 58% of consumers would pay a premium for brands that deliver a great experience. This was a noteworthy study, one, because if a brand can charge a price premium, it's really the acid test of a powerful, strong brand. And two, it was conducted with over 4,000 respondents across the UK, US, Australia, and mainland China. That means the study carries weight. So the first point I'd like to make with regards to why build brand experiences. Well, anticipation is enjoyable. And if you think about anticipating events, maybe coming to IBTM, you know, the minute Ben contacted me, I was delighted. I was really looking forward to it. My first in-person event for over two years. So anticipation is enjoyable. If you think about the lead-up to this event, or if you're thinking about the lead-up to Christmas, how do you feel? There's generally a positive sense of anticipation. Contrast that if you've bought a physical product some clothes, some shoes, or maybe some items for your home. The experience tends to be characterized by frustration. This is why the clever people at Amazon have developed Prime, because they understand that when people buy a physical object, they want it now. Whereas experiences are anticipated, and anticipation is enjoyable. So why is anticipation enjoyable? Well, anticipation releases dopamine in our brains. Dopamine is a transmitter associated with pleasure and reward. So the anticipation of pleasure and reward is enjoyable. So in terms of you and running events and thinking about organizing events, what does this mean? Well, in the lead up to your events, it's absolutely key that you build a sense of anticipation. Paint a picture of the wonderful experience that people are going to encounter, the people they'll meet, the knowledge they'll acquire, how they'll build their network, the after party. 
So build a sense of anticipation around the brand experiences that you're going to build. Because anticipation is enjoyable and experiences are anticipated. The second point is that experiences bring enduring happiness. If you think about it, maybe you've bought a car. When you sit in the car for the first time, the seats feel fantastic, the leather smells wonderful, the sound system's awesome, there's room for the kids in the back. It's great, you love it. But with time, that physical object loses its novelty. It fades and becomes part of the new normal. Contrast that with experiences. Maybe you're planning a trip to go to a wonderful diving location in Asia Pacific, and you'll learn about diversity, marine biodiversity. Or maybe you go to a dinner party and you chat to some wonderfully interesting people and learn a lot from them. These experiences can be internalized. They add to the fabric of who you are. And because experiences can be internalized, that makes them intensely personal and intrinsically valuable. We are the sum of our experiences. And that's why experiences are so powerful, because they add to our sense of self-worth and self-value, and that delivers enduring happiness. That contrasts sharply with buying a new physical product, which soon becomes the new norm. So what does this mean if you're thinking about organizing an event? Well, make it clear to your participants that your brand experience will deliver touch points that will enable them to add to who they are. They'll acquire knowledge that will enable them to be better at their jobs. They'll build networks that will enable them to be more effective. These are a variety of things that you can do to help build more effective experiences and so sell the power of brand experiences into clients and colleagues that may be experiencing difficulties with moving beyond experiences to brand experiences. Brand experiences facilitate consistency at scale. Let me explain this through a story. Some years ago, I spoke at an event in London, and the lead up to the event gave me the feeling that the event was pretty conservative. It was an event for serious business professionals. The communications, the tone of voice, it was fairly serious, fairly conservative. Absolutely fine. The day of the event came around. I thought I'd best be on my best behavior, brushed down and squeezed into a suit that I hadn't worn for some years. Got to the venue, it was in central London, a big venue that shared with financial institutions and relatively conservative organizations such as insurers and so forth. So I was bracing myself for a fairly conservative, relatively dry type of day. I got to the event and went up the escalator. It was a bit like deja vu here at IBTM. I went up the escalator and then I couldn't believe my eyes. Cool, ambient lighting. A barista making coffee or inviting you to have a go at making your own coffee. Help yourself popcorn. Cool, funky, acid jazz playing in the background. I thought I'd turned up at the wrong place. Then the client came over and said, Hey, Darren, how's it going? Great to see you. What do you think? And so through my bitten lip, I said, Yeah, it's, it's great. And I was thinking, what is going on? My perception of what the event would be like before and what it was like then were completely different. So we made our way to the keynote room, and it was pretty much like every other generic keynote room I've ever seen in my life. Vanilla walls, nondescript art, stage, chairs set out. And it confused me even more, because the entrance to the event, it felt like I'd stepped into a parallel universe. I thought, what had happened? So this is a classic example of an organization that had focused on the trappings of the experience, but hadn't thought carefully about how they can connect and express their brand through the experiences they built. They'd have been far better off to deliver a consistently conservative experience. So what does this mean 
for you when you're organising an event? Well, what it means is that you need to check in with your brand before you build the experiences. And that will enable you to deliver consistent brand experiences at scale, within channel, and between the channels that you've got. Because if the experience isn't consistent, people won't know how to connect with your brand at an emotional level. And if they don't know how to connect with your brand at an emotional level, they'll back off. Building brand experiences provides an infinite number of opportunities to differentiate yourself. If you think about banks 10, 15 years ago, a lot of them used to try and differentiate through physical features. The stores, the number of branches, number of ATMs, or possibly the design on credit cards. Competing through functional, physical product features is a limited strategy because there's only so many things you can do. And once you've exhausted all of those options, you commoditize your offer. And when you commoditize your offer, your only competitive route is price. And nobody wants to be competing through price. Contrast that with an experientially driven bank. And let's focus on retail, for example. You walk into a branch, what do you see? Maybe a welcoming member of staff. The next thing you see, maybe some customers that are relaxed, sitting on a comfortable sofa, and a generally welcoming retail environment. Just three touch points provide you with numerous opportunities to differentiate your brand. Then open that to other retail touch points, paying money in, have a meeting with the bank manager, there are multiple touch points, even within retail, that provide you with opportunities to differentiate your brand experience. Then open that to digital, social, phone. The number of opportunities that experiences, brand experiences, provide you to differentiate your brand increase exponentially. This is a million miles away from companies that focus on differentiating through functional product features, which soon can be exhausted and then expose you to price-based competition. So what does this mean for the events industry and if you're organizing an event? Well, what you need to do is help your clients or colleagues move beyond a very functional product-focused mentality. Help them map out the touch points of the experience and then intersect those touch points with the experience to show how you can bring your brand to life in meaningful and emotionally relevant ways. So I'd like to do a recap of where we've got to so far. In the first point, the first part of my keynote, I wanted to outline why it's important that you differentiate and compete through brand experiences. Anticipation is enjoyable, experiences add to the fabric of who you are, brand experiences drive performance, they provide an infinite number of opportunities, and they facilitate the delivery of consistent experiences at scale. Now I'd like to move to the second part of my talk, where I'm going to outline why it's important you give your experiences emotional appeal by expressing your brand through the experiences that you build. So, what I'd like to do is, if you could vote, so if you could grab your mobile phone, and if you go to pollev.com forward slash Darren C942, and just one word, how would you like your clients to feel about your brand? Loyal. Happy. Confidence. Important for services brands because you want to reduce perceptions of risk. So confident is playing through.
confident, loyal, happy, excited. Could I ask who said confident? Who said confident? Lady in the blue. What do you do to help your clients feel confident? Yep. Yeah, to inspire confidence in your brand. Who said excited? Somebody must have said excited. Hello. How do you help your clients feel excited? Mm-hmm. Yeah, get them warmed up. So there's a variety of emotions that you want your clients to feel. And this is really important because brands operate in the emotional space. And experience itself doesn't have an emotion. It's how you express the brand through the experience where the value lies. So the emotions we feel associated with a brand in memory drive behavior. And this is important because brands operate in the emotional space and human decision-making is primarily driven by the emotions we feel. So the next point I'm going to make is important. This is really important. So when we make a decision, the front of our brain accesses our long-term memory and sends electrical impulses to our part of our brain called the limbic system to get an emotionally related response. So in practical terms, what this means is that it's not the memory associated with the brand that influences choice. It's the emotion you feel associated with the brand-related memory that influences choice. So it's not the memory associated with the brand that influences choice. It's the emotion you feel associated with the brand-related memory that influences choice. That is a subtle but hugely important point. One, because human decision-making is primarily influenced by the emotions we feel. Two, brands operate in the emotional space. So if you aren't building brand experiences, you're not capitalizing on the emotive element, which is the tune that the human brain is receptive to. So that was quite heavy. So I'd like to lighten the tone by taking a trip down memory lane. This is a Volvo 240 GLE. Has anyone ever sat in one? Did anyone's parents ever have one? Yes. So you will probably understand the joys of the story that I'm about to explain. My dad's a wonderful person. I love him dearly. But my dad had one of these cars when we were kids. And the back seats, when you sat on them, there were two characteristics. First, leather. Black leather. Second, when you sat in them, you just sank down and down and down and down you almost felt like you were sitting on the chassis. Combined, this didn't make for a great trip. Every summer, we used to go to Cornwall in the south of England for a holiday. It's about a six-hour drive on a good day. So as a kid, inevitably, after 15, 20 minutes, Mum, can I go to the toilet? Notice, I would ask my mum, not my dad, because I knew what was coming. No, we're not stopping. We need to keep going and beat the traffic. 10, 15 minutes later, mum, can we stop? I really need the toilet. At this stage, those damn leather seats were getting hotter and hotter and hotter, and my need for the toilet intensified. Mum, can we stop and go to the toilet? At this stage, one of two things happened. Either my mum went crazy at my dad, 
or my dad got silent treatment from my mum. So inevitably, we stopped at the next services station, pulled over, I went to the toilet, and who do you think followed me in? My dad. So the moral of that story is actually, it's the emotion I feel associated with the brand in memory that drives choice. And I'm afraid to say that's why it's highly unlikely I will ever buy a Volvo. <laughs> so I'd like to recap on where we've got to so far in my keynote. The first point I mentioned try to explain why it's important that you compete through brand experiences. Experiences facilitate anticipation, and anticipation is enjoyable because of the dopamine release. Experiences can be internalized, so they add to the fabric of who we are, and that delivers enduring happiness, as opposed to a physical item, which soon becomes part of the new normal. Brand experiences drive performance, they provide an infinite number of opportunities to differentiate, etc. In the second part of my keynote, I outlined why it's important that you connect your brand and your experiences to deliver emotive value. And this is important because it's the emotion you feel that's the primary driver of choice. So if you are not connecting your brand with the experience, you are not playing an emotional tune that the human brain is receptive to. This is why it's so important to intersect brand with experiences, because brands operate in the emotional space, and human decision-making is primarily driven by the emotions we feel. Now I'd like to turn to the third and final part of my keynote where I'll share a practical management tool that we use extensively with clients around the globe to help them build brand experiences with consistency at scale. So this is called the Brand Experience Blueprint, and it comprises of a three-step dance. So the first step of that dance is called the Brand Experience Environment. These are the big picture macro factors that you need to be mindful of when you are building brand experiences. So for example, your stakeholders, the data, thinking about your perspective and understanding the mechanics of delivery. The next stage in the brand experience blueprint relates to five key intangible brand assets. Brand values, brand personality, brand essence, brand positioning. And the idea is that you define and develop those intangible brand assets in the context of the brand experience environment. So for example, you'll define values or a brand essence that resonate with your stakeholders. Because if they don't, your brand won't have any relevance. So brands are intangible assets. So to bring that intangible asset to life, we need the third and final stage of the brand experience blueprint. And these are the brand experience enablers. So the brand experience enablers are management, brand management tools that you can use to bring your brand to life. They're your employees' behavior, communications, and design. To show you how this works in practice, I'd like to use an example from an event called 15 Seconds, which is hosted in Graz, Austria, on an annual basis. Is anyone here from 15 Seconds or has attended the event? No? OK, well, that keeps things relatively objective then. Um, 15 Seconds is a wonderful event. It's really, really, really awesome. And the reason is because they deliver a wonderfully unique brand experience with consistency at scale across all of their touch points. So the brand is all about curiosity, staying curious. It's for intellectually curious participants who have a hunger and a thirst for acquiring knowledge. So we can see here, stay curious, the language. They've got dodgem cars with virtual reality headsets. Stay Curious is on the, um, oh, I've forgotten what they're called, sorry, what are they called? Lanyards, that's it, sorry, the Lanyards. Europe's Festival for Curious Minds. The speakers 
are encouraged to talk about events, to talk about topics that would pique the interest, the curiosity of the participants. They have a chat show where the topics span a broad range of disciplines, but ultimately they look to appeal to the intellectual curiosity of all of their participants. So the event generates a consistent feel. So how can you apply this knowledge in the context of using the brand experience blueprint? Well, let me show you how it would work in the context of 15 seconds. Well, the first stage is they've took a look at the big picture, the brand experience environment, and they're focused on stakeholders. They've looked at those stakeholders and they've used data to understand what's important and valuable to them. So they've realized through a data-driven approach, they're intellectually curious types that want to acquire knowledge. So they're focused on the stakeholders and the data element. So the next stage is, how does that insight inform their brand building? Well, if we just focus on the essence for now, the essence is all about curiosity. The insight that informed their focus on building a brand that was focused on curiosity was based on the stakeholder insight that was data-driven. They didn't just pluck that out of thin air. They use that external insight to shape and guide and focus the brand that they've built. So for the purposes of illustration, I'll focus on the brand essence, but there would be other elements, brand values, brand personality, brand positioning. And then the final part of the puzzle the final part of the puzzle is how can they bring that curiosity to life? Well, they do that in one of three ways, through employee behavior, communications, and design. So the employees are great at encouraging people to explore the knowledge that they can acquire at the event. They're intellectually curious types that can identify with the participants. The communications, stay curious. Europe's leading event for curious minds. Speakers are encouraged to speak about events that are slightly different and will capture the curiosity and interest of the participants. And then the design, how they design the event, dodgems with virtual reality, augmented reality experiences, spaces where people can go to have open conversations about topics that interest them. So the point here is that 15 seconds has thought in detail about its brand to focus on curiosity, and then they've thought about how they can bring that brand to life with ruthless consistency across a number of touch points to generate a consistent emotional response in my mind. And that's important because it's the emotion you feel associated with the brand in memory that's the primary driver of choice. No emotion, people are going to struggle to remember your brand. And emotion resides in the brand. So, I've set some aside time for some questions. Now's the time for that question. Now's the time for those questions. What questions do you have for me? If you could post them to pollev.com forward slash Darren C942, um, the questions will come through and we can vote on them, and I'll do my best to answer of, as many of them as I can. Uh, emotions and positive emotions around your events. Any thoughts that you have for 2022? Anything to do with coming out of COVID and communicating to your event attendees, sponsors and partners in the right way? Now is your chance. Just head on over to that uh, very convenient URL. Uh, I love that presentation for what it's worth. I thought it was so interesting. Um, a great focus on emotions. Yes, we have a question number one. Thank you. Okay, so there's one question. It's working. That's always a relief. <clears throat> so let's start with that question as others come through. The best way to acquire data is actually in a balanced way. And what I mean by that is try to obtain qualitative and quantitative data. Based on my experience, quantitative data talks in the boardroom. 
It absolutely talks in the boardroom. But qualitative data provides, thank you for the feedback, you're very kind. Qualitative data provides the context. If you have the time and the budget, the absolute best way to get the data is a qualitative stage, focus groups, interviews, etc., where you understand the key themes, the underlying factors. Then quantitative analysis to validate those exploratory findings with a larger sample. And then if you can, do a bit more qualitative to really squeeze out the stories from the people that have responded to some of those surveys. And then that can feed into brand communications, stories, you get tone of voice, all those things. Which emotions do we need to live as partners of the event? Well, the emotion has to fit with your brand and you have to be able to deliver against that emotion with ruthless consistency. That's the first thing. And the second thing is the emotion has to fit with your brand and your story and your heritage and your history. So let's just say you're a fairly heavyweight B2B brand, General Electric. If General Electric was all of a sudden going to try and become a fun, funky, playful brand, it would feel a bit odd. So you need to think about an emotion that fits with where your brand is and where you would like to take your brand. How can we ensure our clients have a good experience if they don't know our brand? Okay, well, the first point is brand building. Yeah, you need to build your brand. There's something that's called mental availability. And mental availability relates to the fact of when your brand comes to mind at a specific purchase point. It's different to brand awareness. Brand awareness is, I've just heard of IBTM. Mental availability is when I think about going to an event for the events industry, I think of IBTM World in Barcelona. So you need to build what's called mental availability because that brings your brand to mind at those key purchase points. How can we have a good experience? Oh, that one's on the rise. Any tips um, for helping an attendee with confidence around COVID safety? Be honest. Yeah, be honest, be open, be transparent. The only person that doesn't make a mistake is the person that does nothing. So best endeavours, show how you're going to deliver against those best endeavours. And for whatever reason, if something happens, just be open, be honest. I got a flight over here. If anything had happened, it would be incumbent on me to inform Ben and for Ben to inform my BTM. Yeah, just be open. As my dad would say, honesty is the best policy. You know you're getting old when you start quoting your dad, don't you? Gosh, which emotions do we okay, we have that? How can we ensure our clients have a good experience? Any tips for helping an employee conference manager? How to deliver event experience with lots of different stakeholders? Okay, good question. So what you need to do at that point is think about your brand and the values of your brand. And think about how your values act as a common denominator for connecting with those stakeholder groups. But it's very hard to be all things to all people. So you've really got to understand who your target customer is and who your target customer isn't. And then think about how you can bring your brand values to life across all of those segments and stakeholder groups to draw those stakeholders in. Values are a bit like a magnet. They pull people in and they push them away. So you have to think about how your values, how your brand values are relevant to one, some, or all of your segments or stakeholder groups. And then through your communications, marketing, design, etc., amplify certain facets of your brand values depending on who you're talking to. So maybe you're talking to the public sector and you would amplify certain parts of your brand to them. 
then maybe you're talking to event planners and you might tone down the public sector side of your brand and amplify another element. But what you have to do is make sure that all of those values can coexist so you have a holistic, cohesive brand that isn't schizophrenic. Because if your brand changes, people won't know how to connect and relate to you. So we've spent 40 minutes together, you're getting a feel for who I am. If I was to go out of that room and come back dressed as like a surfer dude or something, you'd think, where's Darren gone? It's exactly the same with brands. People build an emotional connection and relate and connect to them. So the values need to sit together and they need to relate and connect with those stakeholder groups. How can we ensure our clients have a good, that one's gone, which emotions, what's the average time for building a brand? Brands are always work in progress. Yeah, you need to build and love and nurture and look after brands. They're like babies. You need to look after them and feed them and take care of them. And the minute you stop doing that, the performance will drop. Kraft Heinz learned this with 3G Capital Partners. When 3G Capital Partners withdrew investment, performance dropped. So there's no time for when these things will work or not. Brand building isn't a short-term activity because you are building memory structures. With brands, you are building memory structures, and that takes time and repetition. If you think of huge events, the World Cup, Wimbledon, Brands have been associated with those events for years, decades, to build that association. How to build mental availability? Good question. There's something called share of voice. Share of voice is how much of the media spend you own. And this is why big brands get bigger. And this is why Big brands during the recent downturn have overspent, have increased their spend on media because the competition have gone quiet and media costs have dropped. So media has been cheap. So it's been a great way for the Procter and Gambles, the Unilevers, the Nikes of this world to really own the share of voice by buying the media. Because they buy the media, they control the communications, they express their brand through that communications, and that's how they build the emotional response. Okay. If you have any other questions, uh, maybe just email me afterwards, because I'd like to summarize and then close. So, just to summarize the three key points that I wanted to make. First, I wanted to outline why it's important that you compete through brand experiences. Brand experiences drive financial performance, they drive brand performance. They facilitate anticipation, and anticipation is enjoyable because it releases dopamine. Experiences are powerful because they deliver enduring happiness, because we can internalize an experience. It adds to the fabric of who we are, and that makes them intensely personal. They facilitate the delivery of consistent experiences at scale, and brand experiences provide almost an infinite number of opportunities for you to distinguish and differentiate your brand. That was the first point that I wanted to make. The second point that I wanted to make related to why it's important you weave your brand into the fabric of the experiences you build, because Humans' decision-making is primarily driven by the emotion we feel, and brands operate in the emotional space. So if you are not integrating your brand into the fabric of the experiences you build, you are not going to be playing an emotive tune that the human brain is receptive to. And that will be a problem because you won't come to mind. The third point I shared related to a practical management tool that we share extensively with clients around the globe, the Brand Experience Blueprint. And if you use this, it will help you structure your approach to building consistent brand experiences at scale. So now I'd like to close. I open my talk by outlining a scenario that I see play out time and time again in the events and indeed other industries. 
Someone's encountered disappointing performance because they're focused on the trappings of the experience, not the substance of building brand experiences. To win through experiences, my advice is don't focus on experiences. Think about how you can weave your brand into the fabric of the experiences you build to give them meaningful, distinctive, emotive appeal. It's my sincere hope that my keynote will help you do that today. Thank you. Wonderful stuff. Thank you so much, Dr. Darren Coleman. That was absolutely brilliant. Uh, my TLDRs, if you want to build an event brand experience with consistency at scale, it's all about the fields. But thank you so much, Darren, for giving us that amazing blueprint, environment, essentials, enablers. Um, if anybody wants more information from you, uh, can they get the blueprint from you? Can they, uh, is that all on your website, etc.? Yeah, sure. Or just email me. Uh, I'll be happy to share it with you. Okay, fantastic. And if you would like to yep, you take a photograph there, all of Darren's contact details are here. Please do feel free to connect with Darren, myself, and Mr. Ben Myers, who's down there on LinkedIn. Go and say hi to Ben at Stand A12 and learn about Thinking Heads roster, which includes folks like Richard Branson, Malala, Guy Kawasaki, Dr. Darren Coleman, and my good self. Um, ladies and gents, thank you so much for joining us. It's been wonderful to see you here. I wish you every success with your IBTM World experience and every success next year with the exciting events. I can't wait to see what you all come up with. Have a great IBTM world. We'll see you later. Thank you.